so memories are named memory locations. Two of our definitions of variables, it's something with a name, a type, a value, and a memory location that holds that value. We don't really care about the memory location, but we understand it right here. here. Gigabytes of, of RAM has to have a place to hold the number or the string that you're storing it in. The contents can vary or differ over time. It's good news because that's why they're called variables. Then there's a declaration, that's a statement that provides a variable's data type, an identifier, and optionally an initial value. Did I cover this? Is this slide looking familiar? Especially is the next slide looking familiar? No, okay, that's what I thought. All right, now this is true. Generically, generally, Python's a slightly different beast. Its syntax is way simpler than a lot of other programming languages. And part of that simplicity is that you do not have to give a variable a data type when you declare. You don't have to say string space name. You just say name, right? An initial value, on the other hand, is how it knows the data type. So it's like this is mandatory in Python. And you don't do this, right? So when you take the quiz, if it asks you, if the value is optional, you know, just obey the rules. And uh, when you're actually programming, just know that of the four things that a memory uh, variable has, Python does not make you specify a data type, but that data type is assigned when it's declared, just like the memory address is assigned when it's declared, right? We don't go in and we say name is equal to Joe and then say, oh, and I want you to store that in RAM address number 1,003,271, right? So we don't, all we do is we specify a name and an initial value, the identifier. It calculates the data type. It calculates the memory address and we're ready to go. So, so just want you to, to know that languages can differ, sort of, from what we're seeing in the book, because the book covers a whole bunch of languages. The book will use different terminology. The book uses the term module rather than function. I will use those terms interchangeably. And then if you go and you take scripting, you will find out that Python uses the word module in a completely different sense. Python uses the term module to mean a file you know, a, a PY file with a bunch of functions in it. And those functions, this thing's calling modules, we're calling it functions. It, it, it'll it'll make sense, it'll flow. Just know that we're learning a specific, like the, these are the specs, right? This is a blueprint for the house, but when you hire the architect, you start giving more details, right? You know, I want the I want this material for my countertop, and and you know I want it to be this color and stuff like that. And hey, can you uh, can you give me a larger garage or whatever, right? You know, so the end result can look different than the blueprint. This is general computer sciencey stuff, well worth knowing. But there's always a difference between book learning and practice, and we're learning both. So there's something called declarations. Declarations is when you declare a variable. And in a lot of languages, when you declare a variable, you say what kind of variable it is, and you give it a name. Just like I mentioned, string space name. They're using the generic term num to represent number. But there's two kinds of numbers, right? There's ints and floats. So a lot of languages will say int space my number, and float space my cost, right? And and space my height and inches, right? We can do that. When we're writing our pseudocode, we can go ahead and declare our variables. You don't have to declare your variables up at the top of a program file. It's considered kind of good form, right? Just like uh, when you write a five paragraph essay, you know, it's good form to make the first paragraph, uh, you know, the introduction and what you're going to be talking about. And maybe if you turn in a, a five-paragraph essay that doesn't follow that form, the count that the other teacher is going to count off. Well, I'm not going to count off if you don't follow this format. I'm going to show you what this format would look like in a Python program. But I'm not going to count off if you don't follow it in the future. You don't have to declare all your variables up at the top. We haven't been, but we could. So we're going to demonstrate that.
I'm thinking about a program that calculates compound interest. Like pretend you had a checking account that gave you 20% interest a year, right? That'd be pretty awesome. I want to know your bank if that's true. Well, to calculate compound interest, you know, my name. Are we on Lecture F? I think so. So, compound interest program. This is not going to be a full-fledged program, probably. I'm not going to make it ask for, you know, the interest rates and the principal and stuff like that. We're just going to pick some values. We're going to so-called hard-code the values. But first, we're going to declare them. We're going to pretend we're using a language that forces you to declare your variables before you use them. So, why don't we Google up the compound interest formula? There's another version of this formula that accommodates if you're adding a certain amount every month, right? You're depositing $100 every month into this account and it's accruing interest. This is a simpler version that doesn't take that into account. All right, so I see several letters here. P, A, R, N in T, where P is the principal. That's what you start with. You deposited $100 in the account. R is the interest rate, expressed as a decimal, where 1 is 100% and 0.01 is 1%. N is a number of times it's compounded per year, right? You can have, uh, you know, quarterly interest. You could have monthly interest. You could have yearly interest. Maybe we'll just specify monthly, something like that. And then N is also used there, and then T is used there. Now, these are all single letter variable names, and I've kind of told you, you know, to see if you can avoid using single letter variable names. However, this formula is so beautiful that I may stick with single letter variable names. They sure are easier to type in this case, right? P is easier to type than principal, because I probably wouldn't remember whether it was PAL or PLE. So let's use these as our variable names. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to create a declaration block. I should do this in pseudocode first. I should format it in pseudocode first, but it's more fun to write Python, isn't it? Who wants to do the pseudocode? <laughs> Who wants to do the Python? I see more hands for Python. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so our declarations. A equals zero. That's the end amount. I'm putting a comment there to indicate what it is. And I'm also capitalizing and lowercasing their letters. I don't know the reason why. These are chosen as they are. And a P is equal to zero. This is the principle. Principal starting amount. I see a couple more. There's R, there's N, and then there's T. R. I wonder if I can shrink this so that I could. Yeah, yeah, fine. I'm using the, the mouse spin trick that's supposed to make the picture smaller and it's keeping it the same size. First word problems. There we go. Right. All right. R is the interest rate. As a fraction, 1.00 equals 100%. All righty, and then there's, I don't know why I did R is equal to R. Is that a stupid statement? Say, yeah, that's a stupid statement. Everybody agree. Okay, now, if you did it, I wouldn't call it stupid, right? But I did it, so I'm calling it stupid. It's supposed to be R is equal to zero. R equals R is a completely useless statement, right? You're just saying, yeah, I'm copying the value of R into R. 
but it's even more stupid because it would be a syntax error. Can anybody tell me why r is equal to r would be a syntax error? We, yeah, we've never defined r to begin with, so it doesn't have a value, and you can't use a variable until it has a value. All right, and then there's n. Oh, I forgot to fix it. R is equal to zero. N is equal to zero. Number of times per year. And then there's T is equal to zero. Years. All right. Looking good, except and now they don't have any values. To make a good program, we need the input statements. We could be reading this from a file. We could ask the user. This is what's calculated. So I think I'm going to come back up here and put calculated next to that, just so that in the far future, somebody would understand that that's going to be something that's calculated. And the rest of these are input variables. I'm going to be lazy for now and just like I said hard code some values let's say that I'm starting off with a thousand dollars the interest rate is 10 percent so 0 0.10 how many times a year this is monthly interest so 12 times a year and t is equal to 10 years. Now the fun part is expressing that formula as an expression that a computer will understand because a computer will not understand the formula as written. What do I mean by that? Let me bring the formula back up. Zoom it out a little. If I type this in as is, Let's see if we can get that going, but it's not going to work. So you can skip this if you want to, but A equals P, parentheses, 1 plus R divided by N, in parentheses, and how do I raise something to the power of? Yeah, star, star, not carrot. That's how you do Math books teach you to do it. <laughs> not how you do it in this language, and that's not dumb. You will see me type in carrot up here, making the same thing. Okay. Now, this is broken. This is a syntax error. Before I go and tell you why, there's two problems, three problems with it, one of which you may know I may have mentioned already. Anybody spot a problem? Well, the parentheses are okay. I think I know what you're, where you're going, though. You see P? Next, exactly. Right. Just because a textbook shows you P with no asterisk, you know, people in the math world understand that that's multiplying by that. We've all taken math classes so that we know that. The, book, the computer programs do not know that. They treat parentheses as function calls. Completely different meaning. So I need to put an asterisk there. There's another place where a per, eh, I may have said that wrong. I have to put an asterisk, yeah, between the N and the T as well. And there's one error left, but it's a more subtle one. This one would compile. It would compile now, so it's no longer syntax error. No, that one's okay. I could do it. It wouldn't break it. And when you said uh, parentheses, now I get it. You probably meant that there should be parentheses around N and T. And that's correct. We could break it down further. We could put parentheses there. Would not break it. But those aren't necessary. The reason why is because of him, das, please, excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the order of evaluations, multiplications, and divisions happen before additions and subtractions. So this part would happen anyways first. But if there's ever any doubt in your mind, go ahead and use the extra parentheses. It's not a bad idea. I may leave them there. I like them. Okay, now that's a valid calculation, but I ought to say what I'm doing. 
ought to say what I'm doing here too, so maybe I'll give a comment. Determine values. That should be a place where we have you know four input statements. And then calculate interest. I know it's hard for y'all to see when it's down at the bottom, so I'm going to scroll up a little. And then we're going to display the results. Output results. We're going to use that fancy word output. All righty. Print. Parentheses. Now it's really boring just to print A. Right. Now if I run it, it's going to print something, but I don't know what that number means. I'm going to put some expository text. Final amount equals end quote comma A. Now we can make it look even better. What would be, I mean, not you may not know how to do this yet, but what would make this output look better? Yeah, if I got a checking account balance that looked like that, I'd be pretty concerned, right? There's way too many digits on it. We don't typically calculate digits. I don't know if y'all remember that old Superman movie with Richard Pryor where he became a billionaire by uh, stealing all the fractional cents from the bank like that as a programmer. Didn't they do that in uh, Office? Was it called Office Space, that Mike Judge movie? Maybe the same thing. Yeah, okay. So, anyways, we'd kind of like to round that down to two decimal points. There's multiple ways of doing that. I could show you multiple ways. Do you like knowing multiple ways, or do you want one way to go with? Why don't we just go with the one way to go with for now? When we print it out, we can use what's known as a formatted print. I think I've done this already, but the syntax is a little bit weird. I'm sorry the syntax is a little bit weird, but we just got to roll with it. Percent means placeholder. Dot means it's going to have a decimal place in it. Two means that it's going to have two decimal places, like for cents, you know, three dollars and two pennies. And we need that dot two there because otherwise it might only display one. Right? If it's a uh, two dollars exact, we don't want it to just say two dot zero. We want to specify the number of places. And then F to say that it's a floating point number. Now, unfortunately, just to confuse us, once you have a placeholder, you have to use a percent sign outside of the quote. And that's just something that you'll memorize. And if you get frustrated with using the formatted prints, if my assignment does not require it, if I don't say so, if I don't say it needs to look exactly like that, then uh, you know you could skip it for now. But it's going to make it look prettier. Alright, there we go. I'm, I'm a lot happier. I could think of only one more cosmetic improvement. Well, you know, I, you can always think of a million cosmetic improvements. Uh, a saying is a program is never finished. It's only abandoned, right? Meaning when you finally get tired of making changes to it. What would make that look better? Maybe a dollar sign? How about if we display the initial amount as well? We have a variable, a variable for the initial amount. What was that variable? What contained our starting amount? Yeah, P. So I think I'll just copy this entire print statement, paste it, and then change it a little bit because it was kind of a complex thing to type. So initial amount equals percent do F, but it was P. And we could do the same thing for R and N, right? The rate. What that's called. Maybe there's a, a different term for it that book uses. I forget when we hit it, I'll remember. It's called echoing the input. Right? If you type in a mailing address, you know, for your package, before you click the submit or the purchase button, it'll show that address, right? 
and it'll show you the credit card that you chose and it'll show all the items that you're about to buy and it'll show the shipping method right you'd like to be able to eyeball all that and see that it's correct before you click the submit button right what if you typed it in wrong what if you said you're earning 100 percent you only earned one right and then you got this output and you didn't notice that it was far larger right but if we displayed the extra information right the rate and the number of times per year and the time it would be a better program i'm going to leave that off i'm going to be lame just to save ourselves some typing time now here's a thought question for you the interest earned how would i calculate and display that because if interest earned is not the final amount, right? I started at $1,000 and I ended up with $2,000. How much interest did I earn? I think I heard murmurs. Somebody be bold and say it more loudly. Yeah, you just subtract, right? So the interest earned is the final amount minus the initial amount. So let's do earned equals P minus A. Okay, now our program isn't as structured as it was. For one thing, I was declaring all my variables way up here, right? I was being all fancy like the way the book does it. Earned equals zero. I could just abbreviate it E, right? We're <laughs> abbreviating everything else. And that's interest earned, calculated. Then I better change this down here, where I typed in E is equal to P minus A. I wonder if they're capitalizing all the dollar amounts, if that's why P and A were capitalized, because they represent money. I've never taken an accounting course, I don't know. Okay. So, that's a little bit better structured. We pre-declared our variable. Not necessary in this language. I'm just giving you an example like the book would. And we have this calculation way down here. Is there a better section of the code in order to place the calculation? The way I phrased it, you know the answer is yes. So where should I put it? Yeah, right there. I'm going to cut that now and paste it under here. I better put some comments. This one is to calculate end amount. And this one is to calculate interest earned. And then I want to print that out, right? No reason to calculate it and not print it. So I'm going to copy and paste one of those print statements. I could put it between the initial and the final or at the end, you know, doesn't really matter. Maybe to make it easier to spot, I'll put it at the end, but you can put it wherever you want. So this one is not final amount or initial amount. This one is interest earned and the variable is E. And I made a boo-boo. This says I earned negative interest. There's an incredibly quick fix for that. Well, there's more than one way, but what should I do? Yeah, it should have been A minus P. The ending amount minus the, the, the beginning amount. If I flat out could not figure that, I could use the absolute value function to make it a positive number, but that'd be kind of a cheap hack. Right. Originally, the word hack didn't mean breaking into somebody's computer when the uh, programming was being you know, created in the 50s and the 60s. It initially meant a quick and dirty way of getting something done. And then somehow that turned into, I'm a hacker. Uh, I break into computer systems. All right, let's see if that works. And then I'm going to wander around because I know I type faster than everybody else. Okay, there we go. I like it.
only possible thing I could do to make it even better would be to line these things up, and I'm not going to take the time to do that. I just have to add some spaces to my output. Oh, heck, why not? It's so easy. Right. All I need to do is, you know, hit the space bar a couple of times and line them up. You never have to do that unless the customer is going to pay you money to do it. But I think it's going to make it look pretty. Maybe I could even delete the equal signs, right? Don't know. Don't know if you want to do that or not. Up to you. Now we could have automated that to where we didn't have to add those spaces and it would right justify the numbers and it would left justify the strings. We could have changed our formatting statement a little bit to get that to happen, but that's good enough. And then I'm going to put a done print parentheses quote done. All right, I kind of wish that I could get this all in one page, right, to make it easy to see. I'm going to paste it into Word, I guess, because I know how to zoom Word in and out real easily. I know you can't read it now. I'll switch back to the other one. But this is how the book would show it, except they would have tabbed this stuff over and it would be pseudocode, so it would probably have the word set in front of it. And these would not be nearly as fancy, right? They would just say output P, output A, output E, that kind of stuff. I don't like the fact that the book shows these declarations being tabbed because we don't tab them in our language. But again, you know, there's theory and then there's practice. Pseudocode is designed, you know, to be good for everybody. And different languages implement different things. Some languages, it would not break it to tab them over, like the pseudocode shows. Python is picky in some ways and much more flexible and easy to use in others. All right, that makes sense. This looks kind of good. I could take this code, this thing, and I could paste it in a flowchart and ask y'all to draw it. But do y'all remember what shape? These output, these print statements ought to be. Tilted rectangles, parallelograms. How about the uh, math? Not the diamonds, the, the rectangles. Yep, the rectangles, regular rectangles. If we had any input, it'd be in the same shape. The tilted rectangles, the parallelograms. If we had any if statements or while loops, they would be in diamonds. I love you programming. Yeah, there we go. Like that. And then we would begin it and end it with an oval. All right. If we go back and look at the slide, right, we see, oh, they didn't use set to declare their variables. Instead, they gave a data type, right? So in our pseudocode, we might want to do that. I'm not going to. But if we were changing this into pseudocode, I might want to put the word num in front of these to indicate that they're numbers. I'm never going to ask y'all to do that. I, I don't even care if you put the word set in front of the statements that, that they show using set. Follow their uh, instructions explicitly or do it a little more loose. It's okay. I only have a certain number of rules that I insist you follow, which is that the arrows, you always have an arrow between every shape, there's no dead ends, that every block has one and only one line leaving it unless it's a diamond, in which case it'll have two lines, which have to eventually reconnect. And that the kind of statement it is goes in the right shape. You'll get full credit for those. Do we need to put declarations? No. 
Not unless you code it that way. If your pseudocode looks like it that way, go ahead. The cool thing about putting declarations like that is it lets you, it gives you the right to put multiple variables in a single box rather than one box, my number equals three. Another box, A equals seven. Another box, R is equal to three. If you feel like assigning a whole bunch of variables like that, go ahead and, and stick the word declarations on it. But don't cheat. And what do I mean by don't cheat? Don't define a whole bunch of variables and then do a whole bunch of equations and just think that it's cool to put that in one single rectangle. Your equations should never go in the same box as a declaration. And if you're performing anything more complicated than an assignment of data, like this, right? This absolutely should not go in the same box as this, right? It'd be fair game to put all of this in one box. Also, don't put your input statements in one box, in box, one box, right? If we're asking the user for the number and then for the quotient, don't put input number and quotient. Pretty much every line of code should be in its own shape. It's just that they demonstrated that it's okay to put multiple initial assignments in one box. The only thing I would count you off for is if you put multiple other things in one box rather than just assignments like that. No multiple input statements, no multiple calculations, that kind of thing. No multiple prints. All right, we've talked about this, except we've been more specific. Numeric variables hold digits. You can do math on them. String variables can hold text, letters of the alphabet, numbers, special characters. You can't do math on them unless you convert them. Then there's something called type safety. Prevents assigning values of an incorrect data type. Ooh, sounds great. What if I go in and since P is equal to a, a thousand, don't type this because it's wrong and I'm probably going to delete it. And then later on, I decide that P is supposed to equal something else and I type in P is equal to 10.2. I don't know what it means, why, why I type that. This, in other programming languages, would be counted as an error if we had defined this as an int. Now, since it's a money amount, I would not have declared it as an int anyways, but just roll with it. Once you declare a variable in those languages, you can't store data of another type. I couldn't decide that P was going to equal Paul because I had already put a number in. That's called type safety. Or if I had created a variable called name and put a name in it, and then later on I decided I want to put a number in it for whatever reason, that would be a syntax there in those languages. That's called type safety. Python does not do type safety. Or it only does a limited amount of type safety, right? To where if you do this, A is equal to B plus C. If you're trying to do math, they both better be numbers, right? Ints or floats. That's limited type safety. It does a little bit of type checking, but it doesn't stop you from storing any kind of data you want into any other any variable name, even after you've declared it. Makes the programs easier to write. Right? We did not we would not have to do all of this. Right? We could have skipped that. Shorten our program almost by half in Python, where that stuff's not necessary. I will reiterate one more time. I'm not expecting you to put all your variables up at the top before you use them. So the identifier is the variable's name. The programmer should choose a reasonable and descriptive name for variable. In other words, these single letter variable names I've been using are for the birds. They sure are easy to type. They're seductive. Programming languages have rules for variable names. A long time ago, there were programming languages that required all your variable names to be uppercase. And that's not true anymore. A long time ago, variable names couldn't be numbers. Nowadays, they can have numbers in them. But they cannot start with a number. Tax rate 2008 is valid, but 2008 tax rate is not valid. Some languages allow hyphens. Ours does not. Right? Because A dash 
B in our language would mean A minus B. To do the same thing, we get to use underscores. And honestly, I've never seen a language that allows hyphens in a variable name. And then the reserved keywords are not allowed. What does that mean? In my code, you know, the reserved keywords are shown in orange. We don't even have any reserved keywords in this. That's kind of neat. But if I did, like um, an if statement, if e equals 7 colon print neat. Stupid, right? But we see a keyword there. The keywords are reserved words. They're the words that con uh, control the logic of the program. Our logic is just top down, so we haven't seen any keywords yet because top down doesn't require you know changes in logic like if statements and whiles and stuff like that. If you tried to do this, if is equal to seven, if for some reason you thought that was a great variable name, it was an abbreviation for international funds or something like that, that would be a syntax error. There are more subtle versions of that though. You don't want to mix function names and variable names. What do I mean by that? What if I decide to name a variable print. Print is equal to one, two, three. For some reason, I decided I need a variable named print and I needed to hold a value, so I do that. That's not a syntax error. It'll run just fine. But if I had that somewhere else, it would break the program. If I had it before these print statements, and I'm going to probably wind up deleting this entirely, so don't be making every little change I make here. There we go, right? And kablooey, now we have runtime errors. Why? I have redefined what print means. Right? It's like I closed Walmart and I built a, you know, I built a bank there. It has a completely different function. Print has a completely different purpose now that I've stored a value in it. It's no longer a function for displaying output. So even though it is legal in this language to accidentally overwrite a function name with your own variable name, don't do it. How do you know you did that? When something breaks, you know. Or if you type it, our variable names are supposed to be black and it's showing up in purple, that's a bad sign. There's one function called sum. I love using the word sum as a variable name, right? I'm going to calculate the sum of, of, you know, of all the scores. And then when I do that, I break the sum function. The sum function would no longer work, which is okay if I'm not using the sum function, but just as a general rule, Make sure that your variable names do not duplicate function names. That's a problem with using something like turtle, right? If we're, use, if we're dry, dry, uh, creating a turtle program, the word turtle means something very specific. That would be either a syntax error or it would break the program, one of the two. So I'm just going to put a couple of comments here about variable names. Maybe I'll even open a multi-line string so I can just babble. Variable names, also known as identifiers, can be letters, digits, and underscores. No spaces. Cannot be keywords. Reserved words. I'm going to add on or functions even though I told you that technically you can, it's just an extraordinarily bad idea. When you take other programming languages, other special symbols may be allowed, like dollar signs. So you could do profit dollar sign or dollar sign profit. In some languages, you have to use a dollar sign for something in certain variable names. It's a good idea to learn, learn one programming language. It's an even better idea to learn two programming languages because once you learn two programming languages, you could probably sit down and learn the third in a matter of days because you've already got all these concepts. Now, that's not strictly true if they are completely, completely different alien things, right? But like if you learn Italian and then you learn Portuguese or something, I think those are pretty closely related languages. You could probably learn a third Romance language pretty easily, but that would not help you a bit in, in learning, you know, some uh, flavor of uh, Japanese or, or German or something, which are fairly dramatically different. Still, the concepts are going to apply. Loops and functions and variables, right? That's going to apply through pretty much every programming language you ever encounter.
All right, variable names are case sensitive anymore. So that only ca that only catches us like people are used to typing in capital letters. And so if you price, say price is equal to three, and then you say you know total is equal to price plus two, that's going to be a syntax error because you use an uppercase and a lowercase. Right, no biggie, but when we're doing it in class, you'll get a syntax error. I'll wander around, and if you haven't spotted it by the time I get to you, I'll say lowercase, right? So they are case sensitive. That's another rule. Case sensitive cannot start with a digit. Now, I don't recall if the book demonstrates this, but people have different ways, different tastes for picking their variable names. It's a very uh, personal style thing. And if you work at a company, they may dictate the style for you. But here's one way. Final score is a valid variable name. Final underscore score is also a valid variable name. Final score with no lower uppercase letters is a perfectly valid variable name. I'm fond of this because that's the way that people did it in the 70s and the 80s when I first learned programming. This is the way that the cool modern hipster programmers do it. This is by far the industry standard anymore. They only use underscores when creating constants and using all uppercase. I don't know when that switch came, but well, it kind of came with the invention of Java. But before that, Microsoft was, was using, switched to using that. This is known as camel case because the uppercase letter puts a hump in the middle. Honestly, didn't make that up. Why would you use either of those two? To make it easier to read. If you have a long variable name and it contains multiple words, since we can't put spaces, we can't do final space score, then hopefully this is easier to read than that. You may think differently. You're allowed to think differently. You don't have to do either one of these two unless you work at a company that requires it. I'm not going to count you wrong for either way. Just showing you that there are choices. One reason I don't like doing this, although I'll do that accidentally because other uh, because the Java textbooks hammer that in. But the reason I don't like to do it in my code is just because I can guarantee that if I'm doing that up here, some people will sometimes capitalize the S and they won't capitalize the S other times. Same reason I try not to use lowercase l if I think it can be confused with a 1. Uppercase i has got the same problem, right? All three of those things look almost the same. I don't even care if you're consistent. If you feel like using underscores sometimes and capital letters another place, I'm not going to count you off because it's like if I was teaching how to use uh, Adobe Illustrator, I would not count you off if you were an artist. I would like to give extra credit for the people who are artists and make beautiful art like you. All right. So they should have an appropriate meaning. Single letter variable names are lousy. You know why I use them because they're easier to type and uh, they also, you know, fit in with some of the formulas we see when we Google the formulas. That doesn't mean I won't use single letter variable names. I think that they are correct when you're creating counters, right? If you're just going to write something that's going to count from, you know, 1 to 100, Typing X as your counter is a lot easier than typing the whole word counter, right? So X, Y, and Z are common counter variable names. I, J, and K are common counter names, right? I need three counters. I'm going to make the first one I, the next one J, the next one K. That's just, those are no not rules, just stuff that you see out there in the wild. Camel case. The hump in the middle with an uppercase. Pascal casing. I honestly had not even known that this style had a name until I got to this textbook. That's where you put a capital letter as the first name of your variable. I strongly recommend not doing that because a lot of languages now reserve capital letters as the first letter in a variable name for a very specific purpose that we're not going to get to for a long time. So how about our rule is in general Try to use lowercase letter variable names. I don't care if you mix uppercase and lowercase like they show here. And I will break that rule when I do uppercase letters like in this example. 
But if it's a, if it's more than one letter long, I never begin a variable with a uppercase letter, just because that's been burned into me by C sharp, C Java, a, a whole bunch of object oriented programming languages where an uppercase letter at the beginning means something very very specific. And then there's Hungarian notation. Hungarian notation it wasn't invented by Hungary, but it was invented by a programmer at Microsoft from Hungary and so the his fellow programmers teased him by calling it Hungarian and then since Microsoft wrote so much code and so many manuals and stuff like that it became adopted in the industry it's no longer that popular but it's putting the data type in the variable name like you could do int you know uh, something you would need a counter for or right or inches you could do float you know, uh, average, right? You could do string name. You could abbreviate those things. You could do I, you know, for counter to indicate that it's a, a counter. S to indicate that it's a name. And since I learned programming, or at least a, a good portion of my profitable career was writing code that, you know, did stuff with like Microsoft languages, then I did, a, a, I did start doing that. I have unlearned it for this course. I no longer do, uh, or, or I've unlearned that. I don't do that. But if you ever see it, that's what they're doing. They're trying to tell you that, oh, name is a string, and that average is a floating point number, and that inches is an int. Now, why would you need to know that? Because we mentioned type safety, where if you store the wrong kind of data in the name, it would be a syntax error or it would crash. So it was real helpful for programmers back in those days to uh, who use languages that were strictly typed so that you would know if you were halfway down in the code whether average was an integer or a float or a double or any other number you know, of uh, different data types. Don't see that a lot anymore. I'm sure a lot of people still use them. Snake casing. That's when you use underscores. I like that. Snake casing. And then mixed case with underscores, which is similar to snake casing, but new words start with an uppercase letter. So I guess it's a camel mixed with a snake, some mystical creature. And then kebab case, like shish kebab, or any other type of. Never seen those. I'll never ask you a question about snake casing, or mixed casing, or kebab casing, or pascal casing, or Hungarian, or camel case. None of my quizzes will have any of those terms in them. If you run across a, a, a term like that while taking a quiz, and by the way, it's totally fair to just go and hit the book to look something up while you're taking these quizzes because that's the way my exams are. They're open book. They're just learning. that They're, they're not knowledge testers so much as learning tools like worksheets. Okay. The assignment statement. In pseudocode, it's set. Set something equal to a value. That's called the assignment operator, the equal sign. In every programming language I know, you don't use the word set. That's a pseudocode thing only. So if you start leaving the word set off on your pseudocode, I'm not going to count you wrong. If you start using the word set in your Python code, it's going to crash the program. So yeah, obviously that is wrong. The assignment operator is equal sign. And here's a fancy term. It's a binary operator. We'll hear that term again. What does binary operator mean? It means it's all ones and zeros. Well, in this case, binary means two, meaning it needs two so-called operands. An operator is the symbol. Plus, minus, addition, power of, or the equal sign. All of those are binary operators, meaning that they take two things. They take two pieces of data to work on. If you're going to do multiplication, you better have two numbers that you're multiplying. If you're doing, you know, division, you better have two numbers. The data that their operators are working on, known as operands. This sounds important enough to add to our notes. Operators are symbols, not words. Plus, minus, division, equal. There's another one called equal equal. 
This is the one you use in if statements. This is the one you use for assigning things, and so on. The ones listed are called binary operators. They take two pieces of data, one on either side. I don't know if any of y'all have ever had a uh, calculator that supported reverse Polish notation. HP calculators, a long time back, used to do that. Maybe some still do reverse Polish notation where if you wanted to add 1 and 2, you would type in 1, hit enter, 2, enter, plus, enter. Now to me, that's a crazy way of adding 1 and 2. But in this case, the plus was a binary operator, but both of the pieces of data came before it. There was no, uh, you know, it wasn't dictated, you know, by the universe or by, by deities that these things had to be in this order. It's just that when algebraic notation was, was created, that's what they decided. Okay, so they take two pieces of data called operands. So if you have this statement, A equals 3, the operator is the equal sign. The operands are the A and the 3. So if you have this statement, x equals y plus z, you may say, well, I see more than two things. That's not a binary operator. That's a ternary operator. No, it's not, because each one of these operators really fundamentally only has two pieces of data. It looks like this equal sign has three pieces, right? It looks like maybe that both of these things are, are operands that hook up to the equal. But no, what happens is, is all of these symbols are processed separately. So this plus sign has two operands, y and z, right, like that. And then once that is calculated, that is one more operand for this one. So he has two operands as well, the result of that and that. And do you have to remember the term binary operator as you're programming? Right? Is that constantly bouncing around in my head? No, but it's a quiz question, an exam question. If you have binary operators, are there any other kind of operators? Yeah, there's one called the unary operator, which is a minus sign to make something negative. Example, minus 3, right? That is really not a digit. It's an operator because it's a special symbol. But what does it do? It just flips the value of 3 from positive to negative. That's about the only unary operator I can think of. I can think of one more, but I, it's not even supported in this language. Is there a ternary operator? Yeah, in some languages it requires three components. So I'm, not, I'm just going to even maybe delete the term unary operator. Or I'll just say the hyphen flips the value to be negative. And then you get into the question of, well, why do they use the same symbol in multiple ways? And, that, and the reason they do that is because that's how we like to write it, right? And I'm surprised that that doesn't cause problems. What if you did this? I'm trying to think of an example. Why? minus minus three right I guess it's smart enough to scan through and decide oh that's a unary operator and it's going to calculate a value for that and then use that as a value to feed the minus sign anyways I remember using a language in the 80s where that would actually break it and you had to do something special in order to get a negative value and that was aggravating as all get out and I've never seen a language that does that since So, the assignment operator has right associativity. There's another quiz word I don't care that much about. But what right associativity means, right to left, right? All of this data gets copied over here. Other operators, like math operators, are left associative, meaning they go from left to right, right? If you have A is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3, you have the 1, and then the 2, and then the three, they're, they're done left to right. 
But the fact that it is right associative is why you cannot do this. So the equal sign, single equal, is the assignment operator. It is right associative, meaning right to left. So you do A equals 3 and not 3 equals A. Right, because we couldn't copy A into a 3, right? The meaning of it. And it's not going to magically know that we wanted to take that 3 and copy it into an A. Maybe it kind of makes sense. Well, why can't you do that? But if, if there wasn't a hard rule, then how would we know what that meant? Would we know whether B was going into C or C was going into B? That's getting way too technical. I don't care. But the variable on the left is called an L value, standing for left value. If it's in a quiz, which I don't think it is, Google up what L value is. It's certainly not going to be on one of my exams. So initializing a variable is when you declare a starting value. All of our declarations were also initializations. Technically, an initialization is when you declare your variable and give it a starting value. If we could, in this language, declare a variable without giving it a starting value, that would not be an initialization. In this language, every time you create a variable, you are initializing it. So, we could use the terms declaration and initialize kind of synonymously in this language. But let's just roll with the fact that if you initialize a variable, you're giving it a starting value. It would be improper to call this an initialization. It's a calculation, right? We're not initializing it. These are the initializations. And if we had not put all these zeros here, then these would be the initializations because they would be the starting values. But these variables started off with these starting values. Could I not have made this a 1,000 there and a 12 there, you know, a 10 there. Could I not have put these good data when I was up here? Yeah, but then they're not really declarations. And like I said, I'm not expecting you to declare your variables separately from the way you write them. It's okay if you do, not necessary. We're getting close to me wanting to talk about the homework. Garbage, a variable's unknown value. In some languages, once you declare a variable, if I did this string name, but I don't initialize it, it contains garbage. What does that mean? It, it contains whatever was out in, uh, in the memory at that specific address. And Python doesn't do that because you always have to give it a value, right? A variable doesn't even exist until you give it a value. So you never have garbage values in uh, this language. And variables must be declared before they are used in the program. True enough. If you don't have a variable value for it, then you can't use it, right? In this code, if we try to do this, if we try to do, uh, you know, start at a t, but we had never put a value into t, well, it doesn't know what t is. Like if I told you to bake a cake and you didn't know what sugar was, you couldn't do it, right? We have to define every variable. They're calling it declare. Every variable has to have a value before it can be used. Let's roll over to what the homework assignment is going to be. Take the interest program we wrote, and I'll include the code in the assignment. I apologize for not having it on, on uh, silent, but I, anyways. Take the interest program we wrote and modify it to have the user 
input the values for P, R, N, and T. So you're just going to ask the user, what is the principal? What is the rate? How many times per year? In other words, ask the user for the principal, the rate, the number of times per year, and the number of years. Right, that's all you have to do is take that program and make those changes to it. For some of y'all, it'll take four minutes. That's fine. I don't care if it's that easy. If some of y'all, it'll take a little longer. That's totally cool. The best way to learn something is to bang your head on the keyboard in frustration while you're while you're working on it. You know, a little struggling is good for you. A lot of struggling to the point where you're going to give up is very bad, and that's when you ask me for help. And speaking of struggling, I forgot to wander around and see how y'all's code was doing. Please be aggressive about asking me for help. Wave your hand if, if uh, I've gotten too far ahead.